rescue us. So last time, or Kathy, maybe you downloaded it last time around. I said, hey, Tim chatted over to us. Or Chris, was it you? I think it was Tim. Yeah, it was me. And I, are you looking for that link? Yeah, because I oh, somehow or another so before I downloaded it, I ended the call and then I don't know how to get to to things. So yeah, I um and I did not save it as well. So all right. Well then 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 it is what it is and we will move on. Let me move my I car. Boy, I gotta tell you, that car was strategically packed. Every single thing had one place it would fit. And we basically lived out of our car for four months. I mean, we had Airbnbs for each month, but as far as schlepping our stuff from one location to the other, it all had to fit. That was a great, great time. It was very interesting because we'd sold everything. So we'd converted the house to cash. We, we owned our office, but we sold it. So converted that to cash, um, put a few things in storage and off we went. And it's kind of like, oh my gosh, it's amazing when you have zero responsibilities to care for a house. Um, yeah, like life, uh, life changes. So uh, the vagabond. Uh, and then get a load of this when we ended up in um, um, Arizona, three months later, found a house, decided we were going to buy it. You guys have no idea how many hoops we had to jump through to get the mortgage, all because for three months we didn't have a fixed, um, a fixed address. They want to know where were you? What were you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, they can see our bank account and they, they know our credit score. You know, there, there's nothing, you know, there's no issue about any of that. But it was astounding what uh, Bank of America made us do, all because for three months we went from by that time we did it for four months total. But for three months, by that time, we had gone from one Airbnb to another one to another one. And who knows what they thought we were up to. But uh, there you go. Bonnie and Clyde. Hey, hey, why did you give up that lifestyle? I'm just kind of salivating as I hear yeah, you. My husband would really, really like that. Yeah, thinking. well, we knew we were going to do two things. We knew that we were looking for a place to to retire. And I, I knew it was going to be in the desert. I, I love the desert climate. And uh, and I said, and we might as well just keep doing our, uh, our little exploration. Uh, so... Um, we got the house and um, we suddenly got pulled into the whole, oh, well, we should renovate this before we move everything from the storage unit. And by the time all was said and done, it was the summer months. And um, we thought, well, um, do you want to start traveling now or should we travel to escape the winter? And, you know, what are we going to do? And so bottom line is it's now eight years later. So, yeah, eight years later. And we're kind of going like we really should go back and do our little <laughs> vagabond thing because it was great to, you know, just choose a city and uh, find an, a nice little Airbnb property and stay a whole month there. Um, and, uh, yeah, oh, look at that. The guy from Proud Boys got 17 years. He was up for as much as 30 some odd years, I think. So, um, wow. Well, that's the lieutenant. That's not the leader. Well, okay. Well, well yeah, wow. Joseph Biggs. Yeah. Hey, wow. Are you saying, are you saying you left eight years ago? Eight years ago yesterday. That's what that photograph was. That was oh, me and Linda. The car had God. finally been packed and we were, our first stop was, um, uh, well, we, you know, we were trying to work our way over to Texas. And from Charlotte, that's at least a couple of days drive. So I think we wanted to spend the night in, um, we were either in Georgia uh, or uh, Alabama or whatever. And then we got over most of the way to Texas by the second day. And so I think it, we took a, it took us uh, three days of driving uh, to get to Austin, Texas. And that's where the first of the four stops in our little mm -hmm. thing. So It, it feels you, like it was three years ago that you were selling all that stuff. And I remember seeing my book for sale that I gave you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because we said, so we said, you know, like we, we don't want to lug books around. And so yeah. what we did was we decided to, you know, do digital copies of everything. And I mean, I, I don't know if at that time, uh, Edie, were your books av available digitally? Because I remember us talking uh, about that you were going to be doing releases. Probably, and, probably you know. not. I think I bought it back from you. I think I bought it. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Dear, we would have just given it to you. <laughs> it's your book. 
<laughs> so <laughs> that doesn't help the cause of truck cross country. Well, yeah, I get that. I get that. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So there you are. There you what are. did you do to work out during those four months, T? I joined a gym everywhere that I went. And in three out of the four places, I hired a trainer. To keep oh, wow. Going. Yeah, because pretty much that photo, I still look like that, but I've put on a lot more muscle mass, but I still have to lose my 20 pounds. That's just the way I've always been. Always been. I can't believe I'm the only guy that has that as the you know challenge when it comes. Oh, you're to not. Trust me, you're off, not. You know, so I've never had, you know, people go, I've never had like a weight problem, but obviously, you know, this is the circle of brilliance. Obviously, I, when I looked at myself in the mirror, I did not say enough already. I never hit a threshold of activation about really getting the diet in check. And, um, and uh, even today, this is the reminder that I get sent by my, uh, by my coach. Just one second here. I'll, I'm going to throw this in and you guys can give me an amen. If you believe this here, God you bless go. you, because whenever I get the urge to exercise, I just go on, I, I get down on the bed until the feeling passes. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> but you know, this, this is, this is true. You can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. You can't. And so uh, yeah, anyway, so, uh, you know, I continue to work on it, but, um, you know, there it is. All right, um, so um, what to do, what to do, what to do. So we were talking about this whole idea about finding center, recentering oneself. And that article, from what I remember, was just talking about ways that you can end up uh, getting back to the true you. And so what I wanted to do, uh, oh, uh, I forget uh, lab labeling the call. No, I'm going to label the call. Oh, I'm babbling. Um, okay. So hi, everybody. It's T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on the subject of decentering. Last time around, uh, uh, Tim had sent over a link to an article, which sadly, I did not <laughs> click on to download. So I don't have the article, but the part that caught my eye was the part about how we go about recentering ourselves when we find ourselves off center. And so that's what I really wanted to talk about today. Uh, to get into it, though, um, I... I want to start at a different spot where the article than where the article started. And that is with the question, how do you know when you are not centered? So it's I'm sure it's going to be different for for each of us, but you guys share with me a little bit. How do you become aware of the fact that you're off center and, and how far off center are you before it even gets your attention? So let's talk a little bit about how do you notice when you're off center? Anybody? I start having emotional reactions to things that I may not want to have an emotional reaction to. All right. Okay. That's interesting. And so that would mean, that sounds like an upgrade response is what gets your attention. Oh, Chris is sending something over. Let's see what this is. Could be. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it was a psychology today. I'll scroll this as we do this, but these are some good ideas. All right. So, um, all right. So, when you notice that you're off center upgrid, my thought is that this is the one that's easiest for us to recognize because people pay attention to where they find their tension. And if your tension goes up, obviously your tension is going to be brought along with it. And so I, I think with this um, decentering or uncentering, whatever word you want to use, off centering, um, I think we're going to kind of notice that one. So you guys have other examples where you'd say like, well, I notice I what? And then you know you're a little bit off center. I notice I notice that I lose my patience. Ah, all right. And and, and I start reacting to things. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be upgrade, but it sounds upgrade. It does sound upgrade. Interesting. You've you've um, identified my personal one when I know that I'm off center. But for me, it feels more like it's coming from a downgrid energy. And I'll just explain. I'll give you some context because it might be a difference of, in context. When I'm starting to move further and further downgrid, um, I become increasingly annoyed by anything that pulls me out of my downgrid state. 
So if my phone chimes because I have a text message, my reaction is, ugh, what is this? You know, or if someone comes to the door, it's like, ugh, what is all this? It's like I'm downgrading and I don't want my um my, I don't know, mellowness, my escape, my whatever messed with. And I notice when I get to the state, I go like, nope, I'm off center. Got to get back uh, to a better place. So that for me is that context, that frustration or, I don't know, disruption sort of thing. Is that what you're describing as well, David, or do you have a different context? No, you know, I just remember I was sitting in a meeting and I noticed the agenda. And this person was supposed to finish talking at 20 minutes to seven and they talked all the way to seven o'clock and I'm just getting more frustrated and more frustrated and more frustrated. So. Yeah. You now, know. That's interesting. If we look at that from attention management perspective, is it because you were being moved into a situation where you felt a challenge and you felt your ability to meet that challenge was shrinking you know, because of what you'd have to do to get out of it or to address it or whatever. Um, yeah, I would say that's accurate. Yeah, because the patience it comes along with some frustration. And even there's an impatience down here. But for, for me, the impatience that I feel or the response that I feel when my my mellow is being harshed <laughs> is, I think, different than when you're in a situation and you feel like, oh, my gosh, I'm stuck here. And, uh, you know people aren't getting it or the conversation is going a direction you don't want to go, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So uh, yeah, in fact, let me share with you guys a little story from last night. So last night we had our little blue moon party and it was very nice. It was just a handful of couples uh, that came over for it and just had some snacks. And I made a little signature cocktail that was far more blue than anything a human should ingest, but nevertheless, it was very blue. Um, and I didn't have it. Curacao. Yeah, yeah, it was blue curacao. And uh, I, I'm not I'm not much of a drinker anyway. And so I didn't have anything to drink. Well, uh, some of the people at the party really liked the signature cocktail. And about uh, halfway through our little party kind of thing, it was time for the activity, which was a quiz about things related to blue moon, to full moons, to, uh, you know, just in that general topic area. So some of it was scientific and some of it was pop culture and all that sort of thing. Like, do you guys know who the very first, uh, where the very first literary use of the phrase blue moon appears? So who was the writer? Oh, Shakespeare. It was Shakespeare. So that long ago, this idea about a blue moon existing and uh, all that. So, you know, it was that kind of a thing. Well, these people, um, how do I put this? I felt like uh, I, I I do have this recurring nightmare where I'm at a client and I'm supposed to be doing a, um, a you know, a, a presentation, lead a training or whatever. And no matter what I do, I cannot get my audience's attention. And they're all talking, they're all doing whatever. And there I am in front and I've got this job I'm trying to get done. And no matter what I do, I can't get people's attention. Well, last night I lived that, that nightmare. <laughs> and they were all having a wonderful time. I couldn't care less, you know, so, but, uh, but uh, it was just interesting to kind of not only see uh, how much fun they were having, coming up with wildly creative answers to these, you know, rather inane questions, um, but also noticing what's going on with my level of productive tension as I'm watching a lot of people who are having a really, really good time, but they're having a very different good time than the time that I, the, uh, that I had intended. And so I'm going like, why am I getting frustrated? I don't care. I just want my guests to be having a good time. Why look, they're having a good time. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so I was kind of thinking like maybe that was more of an upgrade kind of uh, kind of a derailment because I didn't know how to handle that challenge or nothing that I was doing was really working. But what brought me back to center was when I went like, and that's just fine. It's all just fine. So, uh, yeah. All right. Thoughts about that? Have you guys ever had that experience where you just go, this audience is just not really. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I put in the chat, I learned a great way years ago to get attention in a large crowd. And I've used it so many times. Let's hear. You holler out. If you can hear me, clap once. And you go, if you can hear me, clap twice. And, and then two people or two, a group go, 
Yeah. Now people are saying, pay attention. And you say, if you can hear me, clap three times. Doom, doom, doom. By that time, the room's dead quiet. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I learned it from Barbara Rosenberg. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, sometimes we have to do that, particularly with the larger crowds. Or what I found is that there are certain cultures that, um, um, I guess, the the rules of the way a training program kind of uh, unfold are just different in different cultures. Um, where when I'm doing a program in um, in Germany, in Switzerland, oh my gosh, talk about things starting on time. <laughs> you know, it's all very precise. It's all very, very, uh, you know, restrained and all that compared to, I think the most expressive crowd we had was Italy. It might've been Spain, but uh, I think it was Italy. And uh, yeah, so anyway, there you go, there you go. All right, so point is, we have to be able to recognize that, that we are being derailed, we are moving off center. And so it's important to, I think, recognize what are your early warning signs that you are stepping outside of that green circle. So does anyone else have any of their own personal ones they'd like to share? How do you know when something is off center? I have a couple of others I can share. Some talk about that you feel fatigued. Um, you're, you're physically exhausted. That certainly sounds like more of a downgrade uh, kind of a derailment uh, is happening. Um, other hmm. people say when you feel like you're, you're playing um, beat the clock, like you've got a whole pile of things that need to get done and you can get them all done, but there's a deadline. Now, that might sound like it's upgrade, but it really is upgrade because you're saying like, oh no, I've got the ability to meet the challenge. There's just a whole lot that's on the plate. So this idea about um, overworking, uh, neglecting self-care, uh, that sort of thing is a little bit more of an outgrid way that derailment uh, can occur. And then uh, on the in-grid side of things, I think it would be that we notice that we're being um, kind of pulled into other people's uh, emotional um, situations, like maybe a friend is suffering in some sort of a way. And so we, we kind of join them in that suffering and that can end up derailing us because now we're feeling a whole lot of, um, of the emotions that they're feeling, although we're not experiencing the situation that they're experiencing. And so I think the derailment can really occur in any direction. And maybe each of us are more prone to one direction than the other. And certainly there's all these in-betweens we could look at. But do you guys get the idea that, that you know, uh, we've always said that people are patterns. So inside of ourselves, we're pretty consistent in the patterns that we live. If we can recognize the patterns that um, lead us to recognize that we have been derailed, uh, then maybe, just maybe, we can do those things to get back on track before we get too derailed about what's going on. Thoughts about what I've just said? Does that make make good sense? Does that fit for you guys? It does. Yeah. 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 All right. Anything you want to share around that, or shall I throw the next little pile in <laughs> puzzle piece pieces? <in? laughs> All right. So now um, let's go ahead and take a little look at this uh, article that uh, that Chris chatted over. I don't think it's the one we were looking at. Tim can verify or any of you guys that really did uh, look at it. But this just talks about ways to become centered. But I scrolled to the beginning and it just um, it doesn't really talk all that much about first and foremost we need to oh that's what the call was about the difference between being centered and being grounded okay yay 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 um all right so um yeah so being centered being grounded uh yeah but that article i think the one tim sent over had a lot more uh copy describing that whole grounded difference if we, if we can find if someone finds it, that would be great but this is this is along what i wanted wanted to do so i wanted to say all right first thing we have to do is we have to recognize that it's happening once we recognize that it's happening i think we need to do something to deliberately move our mind uh into the place it needs to be to correct this so do you think it would be fair to say that all derailment involves an emotional um, element 
to it. It's not just pure logic. Logic isn't likely to derail us. Uh, I don't know. Uh, no, I'd say that's probably true. How we feel about what the logic is telling us um, could very easily derail us. But the logic itself, I've always thought logic is just kind of neutral. It just it, it is what it is. And how we choose to respond to it is, you know, what, what we really are working with. But do you think it's fair to say that all decentering um, has some sort of an emotional element to it? Yeah, and, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I do, but I also think that I can feel these are uncentered when I feel absolutely nothing. When mm -hmm. I when I maybe uh should is that the right term yeah could should would yeah 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 should be doing something because now there's a value that's being applied to it it's almost like that's feels like a downgrade shift because you're recognizing that you're becoming more detached is that well it's more of a numbness i think i'm talking it's about a numbness it's not it's i mean detachment i think is about centering there's a detachment but I think there's that numbness um, that that's down grid um, that can be a, sort of an unhealthy aspect, yeah. the other the other side of, of emotion. Right, right, right. And so that would put us very, very far down grid. Uh, and then I guess the emotion you'd be feeling then is is apathy, an absence of emotion. So apathy again, two words, um, a pathos. So without passion. So that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so anyway, I, the reason why I brought up this question about is there an emotional element is because if there's an emotional element to it, we know we're moving from our, um, away from our cortex, uh, way, away from our cognitive abilities and more in, onto the limbic side of things. We're, we're getting a little bit more primal and um, reactive and that sort of stuff that comes along with that flight or flight response that gets triggered there. So I think that anything that we can do to move our mind first is going to help us stop that uh, that derailment from continuing. And so, you know, we talk about the Bufflin maneuver, although Diane will tell you she did not invent it. <laughs> so, but, you know, she's who, who she's who shared it. So we're kind of connected to her. But this idea about just for a moment, stop and say, isn't this interesting? So, you know, how is this happening? Well, you know, what's really going on here? You know, any, any question that triggers you to examine the situation from a detached, logical, pragmatic uh, sort of a, a vantage point is going to move you very much into your, uh, your cognitive faculties. And that's going to help you go like, all right, so yeah, I'm derailed. Now, what am I going to do to get myself back to that centered sort of place? And so that's where I think this article and the one Tim uh, had sent is um, is really coming into play because they make this distinction between the difference between uh, being off center and being ungrounded, and the the um, uh, definition they put forward and what we were reading was that when you're talking about centered, that seems to be uh, thinking more about your emotional state, your spiritual state, that sort of thing, where being grounded is more about the physical uh, parts of what's going on. So, so yeah, Th thoughts about that? All right, then let's keep yeah, it. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, that's uh, correct. And, and in fact, um, the article that... Um, Chris dropped in the chat was one I came across from psychology today. And they talk a lot about, um, you know, the connection to our energies. Mm -hmm, we're mm -hmm. talking about uh, being grounded. Um, so it's, it's really interesting when you look at uh, how psychology talks about centering and you're right. I mean, from everything I've been reading uh, it's about being in that uh, green circle uh, in terms of centering, uh, but decentering seems to be talking about the ability to tap into those other energies and to be able to see things from perspectives yes. that are outside of oneself. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because I do think that if you look at uh, Chan's uh, work that we were looking at, I think what we learned from that is that right or wrong, everybody has their own idea of what center is for them. And their idea of center 
uh, could very well be quite a distance from center as we know it in change works. So again, people are going to operate from whatever their their center is. So uh, that center could be um, built from all kinds of beliefs and values and biases and whatever else you want to plug into to that equation that may very well feel like their core, their center, the essential them, but it could be a very far journey uh, from where their center is to the center of uh, where we, we at least, I think, are throwing out there that this is where humanity is at its finest. And how many people out there that we do learn about through media and, and that, how many people do we encounter that are there uh, versus elsewhere, but convinced that they are the center of their universe and it's all perfectly great for them? Yeah. And then, uh, so so we got these people all floating around all over the change grid who believe that they are the center, but here we are uh, trying very hard to get to this center. And I think what we talked about uh, uh, about Chan's work was that when he talks about the things that you do to decenter yourself from your center, what he really is doing is giving skill sets that you would practice that would move you more to the center of the change grid. So his stuff definitely does fit in, although I dare say he's not thinking about it in the way that we, we really think about it. I, I didn't feel anything uh, overly spiritual or metaphysical in what he was putting forth, but there you are. Um, so now we're kind of going like, all right, well, in addition to that, once we get people starting to move a little bit towards this, uh, you know, the, the real green circle, well, what kinds of things can we do to move there? Now, we've talked about PowerPoint maneuvers before and the things that we um, can do at the individual level that we know will immediately move us to this centered sort of place. And we've talked a lot about all sorts of different practices that people might hold near and dear uh, that help them to get to this point and remain in this point and use this point um, as effectively as they, as they can. Uh, so I thought it'd be fun to take a look at some of the things that this article and other articles are saying, this is the kind of stuff that you can do uh, to move yourself center. So let's kind of, so here we are, here are some ways to become centered. Now that's, that's being ground, that's different than being grounded. Grounding before giving. Okay, fine, fine, fine. All right. So here are some ways to become centered. Breathe in for a count of five, then out for a count of 10. Try to do this so slow, try to do so slowly and deliberately. Um, all right, so that resonates with a lot of different practices that people might uh, have, whether it's going to be um, yoga or meditation or whatever. It's polyvagal breathing. What's that now? It's called polyvagal breathing polyvagal breathing well it impacts right. the vagus nerve that's really interesting so um is that uh, something that you've um kind of um just stumbled across or was that in oh no deborah's been teaching it for a long time and so where does deborah fit it in for you guys who don't know deborah's the 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 founder of the money coaching um institute and it's her program i think that shag's been very intimately involved with it's, it's, it's a tool for managing anxiety and stress breathing for relaxation yeah but i wonder like where does she fit it into the coaching practice as you guys are, are oh you know, because people are all stressed out about money so, and when, so when we need to bring them back to breathing and present present sense of mind yeah. And so would we you have do them... that as an integrated step in your money coaching session with somebody? Oh or... gosh, yeah. We'll say, hey, let's take a minute and do some, let's, let's chill. Let's, All right. let's, let's bring the energy down in our body. Yeah. And so that would bring them to this, to the center. Now, the reason why I brought up, where does it get positioned in a coaching kind of a thing? And um, uh, this is going to apply in more situations as well, but when I'm working with a client on change management, or we're doing the Oracle, the self, or any of that sort of stuff, when we create the activity list and have them respond to the activity, to the activity list, I'd like you guys to tell me what would be the impact slash benefit slash consequence of having them center themselves before they answer the change grid 
as opposed to just answer the change grid based on wherever you are, uh, and then we'll move to the center when we get to the more action oriented kind of thing. So we're we're in the sequence. Do we would we want to insert a centering or grounding kind of uh, kind of an activity? Thoughts about that, anyone? Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Would it, be, would it be in the beginning, just so that you're not just top of mind, tip of tongue, answering a question, and you're allow you're allowing space and spending time with the questions before you're answering it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, I could build a case for that. Yeah, <laughs> Kathy, go ahead. Well, you know, if you're looking for, for where the tension is, you don't necessarily want to be centered in advance because you're, you're, you might want to understand where people are emotionally around some things. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you're looking for sheer logic or where, or where somebody is when they are detached about those tasks, um, you know, you would center first. So it depends on what you're trying to discover. Excellent. That was my thought as well. So, so let's see. So Chris, I think that, uh, oh, Chris, go ahead. Did you just uh, unmute? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, you know, it makes me think about as well, but it's a val valid point, but then it brings into play our conversation around Dunning-Kruger, right? How people can underestimate or overestimate a response. Yep. So, which means that you just, you're going to have to go back to this process at some point, like after they take it, you're trying to really identify where some of these sit with a person. If it's, if it's a disagreement, like in the process, mm -hmm. right? Say, so, well, I really don't feel it's that way. So then you're really going back, but there was another unique study that I read that if that after a person takes an assessment, um, they're usually are, uh, the next time that they take that assessment, it turns out to be completely different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they had more time to think about the process and it's more accurate. Yeah. It was a study and some training I went through with Blanchard that they did a um, study around that process. Mm -hmm. No, I think you're absolutely right. So, so uh, building on what uh, Kathy was saying, integrating what Chris has added here, I do very much believe that you could fit the change grid in at multiple places. Um, in your work with a client, and you can then um, set the stage for the use of the change grid in a variety of ways, depending on what your your outcome happens to be. So, if I am, <laughs> pardon me. <coughs> oh, no, pardon me. So, um, when I'm working with a client privately, more often than not, what I've done is I've, I've sold them or they've purchased. Um, the journey package. So journey is a four session uh, change grid experience where during the first session, we walk the path and we figure out the activity list and all that sort of a thing. And then I have them fill out the change grid. And uh, the next session, we kind of debrief what their change grid said. And then um, we talk a little bit about which of these issues are most compelling for them, because if you only have four sessions with somebody, you can't exactly attack everything that's on their change grid. So try to set some little priorities, if you will. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and then I say, all right, let's do the change grid again. But before we do it, let's um, do something to center you. And then obviously, their responses to the same activity is just rather dramatically different because they're looking at it in a different way. Now, why would I want to do that? What would be the benefit to me or to the client to have them have that, <coughs> that initial change grid and then this uh, soon thereafter follow-up change grid? Any thoughts about to, that? To help them understand the impact of their emotions on their choices. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep, I would agree. I'm trying to get a client to recognize that their mind is an extremely powerful thing, um, but it can be a very powerful clarifier of reality. It can also be a very powerful distorter of reality. And so 
um, like any other coaching, you want to meet people where they are. Well, where they are is whatever feelings they happen to be having. So I would not want to center them before they do that particular uh, first grid, because I want to know where are they? What's really going on? To Kathy's point, meet them where they are. <laughs> then, hey, mm -hmm. hey, T, quick question. So <clears throat> I know in the trainings, you talk about how the a particular amount of tension a person has for a particular task, it would grounding or centering really change the amount of tension that they're experiencing? Because if we're not doing any maneuvers, right, outside of um, just having them be able to pause and reflect mm -hmm. on that task, wouldn't it just reveal the amount of tension that's currently there? Because it, we're not doing anything to impact or maneuver the tension. Right. Well, um, uh, let's open that up for everyone to throw in their, their thoughts on that. But I, I would start by saying to you that it's still tension management is happening. So that awareness alone is going to impact their level of tension. So go ahead, Kathy. Throw, mm -hmm. throw it, yeah. Maneuver. I mean, centering, centering is, a, is a maneuver. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so, Chris, in your example, um, you want to g um, give us a little bit of, okay, unmute Chris. Well, so tell, is there a story? Well, here, here's, my, here's, here's my thought. And so I, I guess it's, it's from a point of clarity, right? And um, so if a person, if you put a task in front of a person, I think wouldn't the idea be for them to really consider this task? And that's why we put a description like inside of Change Works to really consider all of the factors about the task and not just give a rating or a response based off of a task. You want them to consider those details mm -hmm. so that you can get an accurate representation about how they really feel so that post answering a task, you don't have feedback such as, oh, well, I didn't think about that part. Mm -hmm. Now, I, from what you've just shared, I just heard three different uh, places to use the change grid. Uh, my mic is loud. I apologize. Oh, no, I hear you just fine. Oh, yo, oh yeah. no, Shaq said it. Put that in chat. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll hmm. see if I can turn it down some for you. Yeah, relative, to, it, relative to all of us, sometimes the gain is high. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. So um, so here's my my thought about what, what Chris has just shared. I like to make a distinction about um, the initial kind of interaction I'm having with somebody and then the subsequent ones. The initial one, I really just want to uh, assess what is happening and not try to influence in any way, shape or form. And yeah, we did the path walk to extract some activities or whatever. And I understand that that alone is uh, stimulating people to become a little bit more logical, but whatever, we, we're going to walk the path. And then I want to know exactly where they're starting from. And I'm, I'm, I do it knowing fully well that the result is going to include all kinds of distortions, all kinds of emotional, you know, impacts and blind spots and logic and all that. But that's where they're starting from. And then I want to uh, make sure they understand this idea. Well, maybe I, I want to teach it to them, but this idea about moving more into logic. And once I, once I do that, then I have them answer the same questions again from that particular, from that, that more centered sort of space, the, the PowerPoint space. The reason why I want to do that is, is I think multi, multifaceted. The, the first one is that I want them to basically understand the power of the mind, the power of their mind. Uh, that without changing anything other than your, your position on the change grid, without doing anything other than making this slight shift in the way your mind operates, look at how you view the world so differently. And so I want them to recognize that a great deal of our work as coaches and therapists and counselors and consultants and all that is that we do meet people where they are in their craziness, in their whatever. And then with doing something so simple, so easy as getting them to switch the, the focus of their mind, we can have profound change. I do that because I want them to see that I've brought them something of value that um, I, I'm not I'm not doing something. Um, um, 
and not and it not be noticed. Like if I said to them, let's start by doing some breathing. And that's the very first thing. Let's start by breathing. What I'm doing is moving them, but they don't, they're not going to then see the big difference between where they are and what value I've brought to them in something as simple as now breathe or what whatever we're going to do for the PowerPoint maneuvers. And then um let them um um, uh, you know, answer it again, and already they're going to feel more empowered. Now, once I've done that, uh, I think I've proven my value. From that point on, I may very well say to them, whenever you fill out a change grid, you want to fill it out from this detached, centered sort of perspective, because you don't need to see that there's a big difference between the emotionally involved you and just the practical you. You're, we, we can start with just where are you at practically? Because I guess what I'm saying, and I know I'm babbling, but um, I want people to recognize that before they do anything, they should center themselves. They should operate from this place of being centered. And from that place of being centered, they can start seeing the world more accurately and decide what the right course of action is uh, to take. So before they do any upgrade, downgrade, ingrid, outgrid maneuvers, I would want them to start by doing those PowerPoint maneuvers to get there and go from there. Okay, I've rattled enough. Thoughts about what I've just said? Anything you want to... Um, add to that, challenge in that, anything? No, thank you for the clarity. It makes um, great sense, everything that um, everyone has shared. So um, yeah. thank you. Well, yeah, and I just, I just, I guess my goal is I want people to understand that there isn't one right way to use the change grid. Um, you can use it in so many different ways and you can position it so many different ways. It's really all up to you and whatever the situation is that you're trying to work with your client. But let's just apply it to self for a second, put this into Oracle of the self. When you guys are, you know, sitting down and doing some goal setting or putting together a big project deployment plan or whatever, hopefully you realize that's an ideal opportunity to do a change grid. When you're doing this for yourself, do you want to just assess where you are uh, or do you want to go like, no, 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 I know how this tool works. Let me just center myself and then let me look at um, these uh, activities and let me really do a very thoughtful assessment of where my challenge is and where my ability is. Um, I think we all understand that's going to be a very different result than if you had just went, what the heck is happening, blah, blah, blah. But ongoing use, what do you think you guys should do? Start off, uh, start off in the moment or take a moment to, uh, to get centered before you fill out a grid. Thoughts about that for your own, your own application? Yeah. I think um, one advantage in doing it before is that it allows you to identify what's, what are the drivers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, you know, because this this some it's that cause and effect, right? There's something that's causing that tension level to be high, right? And that might help you then make a better choice. So I'll go back to my example last night. There I am being the master of ceremonies for this silly little quiz. My audience is having, I mean, they were having a rip roaring good time. Make no mistake about it. So I was, if anything, I was the one that was derailing them. Well, my initial reaction, forget centering myself. I, I'm going to be a human. I'm going to have my immediate reactions. My immediate reaction was really far more upgrade. I think because I could, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do in order to get them uh, to be, you know, the perfect students or whatever. And and then something happened. I don't know that I did something deliberately to recenter myself, other than just remind myself that I have a very well honed skill set for getting myself centered. And then the moment I was there, I kind of went like, "This is actually very funny to be witnessing." <laughs> so. Well, let's have a good time. Yep. Chad, you've unmuted. David, you've unmuted. Go ahead. What would you like to share? I like to start out where I am. I, I, I think that reveals a lot and provides a lot of valuable insight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so, um, so you'll do, well, again, I don't think you guys are necessarily, well, you know, hey, it's great that you can fill out a change grid online or you do it on a piece of paper, but I would like to think that most of you by this stage of your um, uh, training and your uh, experience playing with, with these principles, I got to believe that for the most part, you guys can just stop and say, okay, where am I on the grid? And you know that you're up grid or out grid, down grid, in grid, wherever you might not bother with the exact uh, coordinate pair, but you get the vibe of it. And um, that is what I think is really what's most important. So David, are you thinking about that is your awareness or are you actually filling out a, a change grid more formally? Um, filling it out more formally. Oh, do tell then. All right, good. Yeah. No, I like to know where I'm at. And I think that, you know, centering myself before filling out a change grid would move me in a direction that that I might not understand. Ah, all right. All right. All right. But if you fill it out and you, and you uh, then can see um, where you are, um, then it's true. The change grid maneuvers are going to start moving you around. And that's that's really great. Then would you do it again to see, to check? Or are you just kind of I would. feeling it? Yeah, all right. No, I, 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 I would. I, I've, I've filled out a number of change grids and, and uh, gone back and looked at them again and, and had totally different interpretations. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know we've been uh, even, you know, for years now, we've been looking at turning this into an app that you could use on your um, on your cell phone. And I suppose you could, you could still go to the website, you could still access it. But uh, but as far as using it as a phone app, the problem is that it's too, uh, the, the, the diagram is too, I want to say, too big to really look right on a screen. So we're trying to figure out, can we simplify the, the layers of it and, and all that just to make it a little bit more useful on a small device <laughs> but so far it's just too much to fit too much to fit shags what did you want to throw in yeah yep okay <laughs> all right so um now um let me give you another situation and see how how uh, you might respond to this let's say it's more of an intervention that you've got a client who really is in some sort of upgrade crisis or I don't know, downgrade crisis or wherever it is. Usually crises are more upgrade and uh, outgrid. Ah, no, I could do an intervention for all of them. Anyway, um, would you then want to meet them where they are or would you rather immediately put in place some sort of a, a maneuver to get them out of that particular uh, place? If you guys can do that. Me. Go ahead. Generally. Generally for coaching purposes, you mean? Yeah, 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 you know. Yeah, coaching. I, I think so. I think I want to meet them where they are just to be able to have a conversation and then move to the to a point of centering when they choose to do that. Okay. All right. Good, good, good. And tell us why you would want to use that approach rather than, uh, I don't know, try to move them first. Um, well, I mean, it depends on the situation. It depends on where, how far, how far off they are. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, if, if they're in a panic state and they can't function, then I would want to shift. I would want to help have them maneuver. Um, I mean, it, it, it depends on the assessment. I would, I, I would, but if they were in a place where they could talk about what they were feeling or mm -hmm. and be able to, to discuss it, that might help them just by listening and having them articulate where they are gives them insight on on what's going on in their lives um, and gives me insight on what's going on in their lives. Yeah, and the other thing is 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 that you want to create rapport. If you if you try to move somebody before you've connected with them, you might break rapport. Yeah, that's another. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, if they're way off, you know, you right. don't. Yeah, you don't want. Somebody. Yeah, if they're screaming and crying, I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna have them sit down, take a few deep breaths, you know, think about a time, and and then proceed. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right, look, let me give you guys a kind of a real situation. I'm going to share something with you that is not particularly private because it's been mentioned on her Facebook page, but. Um, 
how many of you remember we had an employee when we were based out of North Carolina named Misty? And yeah, um, yeah so Misty did a lot uh, of work for, well, we find out yesterday that Misty's 22 year old son died. And so oh. uh, you go to her website and there's places to put in, you know, everyone's leaving their notes of condolence and all that sort of thing, but nowhere is there any explanation whatsoever of how Alex ended up passing away. There's no story. It's just Alex passed away. And, um, and we were trying to do the math. We think it was 22, maybe 23. Uh, we knew that he had a child. I don't know if he was married or not. Um, so we, we don't know any of those details at all. So we're thinking like, well, you know, certainly right now, Misty is in the shock of what's happened. You know, her, here she is, a, a young woman herself. If I'm not mistaken, she had Alex when she was maybe 16 years old something like that. So, you know, um, this has got to be really uh, a, a very traumatic thing for any parent to ever uh, have to deal with. But, uh, you know, when you got someone who's at the prime of you, their life there, you know, it's just really tough. So we figured at some uh, point in the next few days, we'd like to be able to reach out directly. And that's where I'm kind of thinking what you guys have been sharing here. Do I want to meet her where she is and you know the condolences and all that sort of thing or um when do you start doing things that are really more intentional about helping her um you know does she have to ask for that help because there's a friendship sort of a thing as well do you just naturally kind of start to do some maneuvers so this to me is kind of a real world example where it's not a client situation, it's just life. So any thoughts about that? How would you guys think about uh, addressing such a situation? Go ahead, Kathy, David, you're on. I, I, I think it's respectful to not try to shift or, sh or change or whatever, but just, just to be there mm -hmm. and just to listen and understand and therefore you don't try to help other than by by your presence yeah by offering or by offering your presence and giving her the option to then take that presence or not yeah. you know accept that or not but i think to move into any kind of action around it i think is premature mm -hmm. um oh. and could potentially disrespect where they are that's right. that's that's where I am on that. Okay. I like that. I like that. Anyone else want to add anything to it? Because then I'm going to see if we can describe it from the change grid's perspective. So, okay. So then if we look at the change grid, obviously we know that Misty is somewhere on this change grid. We also know that we are somewhere on the change grid based on um, what we've just heard. In fact, you know, I think almost all of you have had some interact or had some interaction with with Misty. So when you hear that something has happened to someone that you know of, you're automatically going to have your empathy triggered and you're going to move some way. Who, who knows how far, who knows what direction, that's an individual kind of a thing. But it had an immediate impact on you. So you're somewhere on this as well. Well, based on where you are on the change grid, you could end up then when you talk to Misty, um, speaking to her from where you are instead of where you probably should be to help her better deal with where she is. So do you know what I mean? In order to, uh, to do what Kathy is suggesting, um, we have to be aware enough of our own response so that we can do those things that are supportive and not you know, jump into fix it mode or start sharing our own stories or start asking questions that, um, although we may all be very curious, it's just not really, um, I want to say, it's not the time to be asking for those kinds of details. Kathy, do you agree with me on, on what I've just shared there? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we have to be self-aware enough to go to our centers yeah. and, 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 uh, and go to that space so that she has a place she feels has the freedom mm -hmm. to then be wherever it is she needs to be. Right, 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 right. And so, um, and again, I think that 
um, all of us by, you know, the ages we've all reached right now, we've witnessed or experienced plenty of death of people in our lives. And it's interesting how, how you often observe how other people are uh, dealing with the individual who has suffered the loss or the, the central individual in, in the, the, the loss. Um, I can't tell you how often we've witnessed people who immediately have to go in and start pouring on all the love and support and all that sort of stuff. And I appreciate where it's coming from, but it's over the top. And now that individual's contribution feels like it's become an additional burden on the poor person who's, you know, central to whatever this loss happens to be. And, um, you know, so I think that that's, uh, you know, to Kathy's point, we do have to kind of recognize where our place is on the change grid in response to what we've learned and how that is going to impact our ability to be appropriate or to be useful or whatever um, in a given circumstance. So centering ourselves before we try to center somebody else. Um, all right. So anywho, uh, I know we're at the top of the hour, but I'm uh, just kind of wondering, are you guys finding this in uh, interesting at the very least, uh, but this idea about centering? Because we still haven't talked about grounding. But you keep uh, showing up. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, Kathy. Yes, yeah, him, yeah. yes, okay. yes. Well, we keep showing up. <laughs> then I would like to, um, to, you know, pick up where we left off uh, next time around because I do think, as I've reread this list of centering activities um, and this list of grounding activities, that I wonder where the overlap is. You know, because they're going to say that grounding is more about the physical you. Well, breathing in a, in a uh, prescribed kind of a way could very much get you back in your body, could very much get you back in the moment. And um, is that really more just a mental thing or is there actually a physiological um, uh, grounding benefit of breathing? Um, I would imagine it's both, but yeah. Yeah, thoughts, anyone new? I yeah, I think it's a little different, um, but it's, you know. Yeah. So I guess. Just, yeah, let's discuss it on Tuesday. Yeah, because yeah. I guess the question is really, is there a distinction between centered and grounded? Or, well, obviously they're making a distinction. Is this distinction necessary for us to make so that we are doing both? Um, or, you know, what's it all work when it comes Maybe to. Maybe centering is the process of getting to where you need to ground. Right, but can I get there faster by grounding myself first? Yeah, that's where I would go. I'd ground myself first and then center. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what's going to be kind of interesting to kind of look at. Where does this all fit into any kind of a methodology? Um, uh, I, I think another way of uh, also looking at it, T, uh, particularly from that psychology uh, article, is to also look at it from the lens of energy. All right, excellent. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, and in, by the way, Jean Paget is uh, a Swiss psychologist who, from everything I'm reading, was credited with uh, this term decentering. Really? Well, if yeah. you could send me anything that you've stumbled across on that, I would really like to to see if the definition we've all come up with for what what Chan was talking about for decentering, are we on the right track or do they mean something even even more different than that? So. Yeah, it, it seems to come out of his theory on cognitive development, uh, particularly okay. dealing with uh, with children. But yeah, I'll send you some links. That yeah, I'd be very curious to just, to just kind of know, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, thanks everyone for joining in. Have yourself a wonderful week. Oh, it's Labor Day weekend. Um, by the way, those of you that are participating in Oracle, Oracle of the Self, I'm still going to do the call on Monday um, because it's early enough in the day that it's not interrupting with anybody's Labor Day plans. But nevertheless, uh, have yourself a wonderful, safe, happy holiday, and we will pick up where we left off next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. All righty. Yeah.